Great. This morning, I have Tessa Katrong joining us. She's the BC NDP candidate for Vancouver Langara. This is Tessica's first campaign for public office. And she's running up against Michael Lee of the BC Liberal Party. Tessica has a big task at hand, trying to convert this riding to NDP after being a BC Liberal strong stronghold since its inception in 1991. Tessica is the founder of City Hive, a nonprofit that tries to engage young people in civic processes and has been involved in a long list of local activity groups, task force, and organizations. We're excited to talk with Tessica this morning about getting youth involved in politics, climate policy, and her experiences running for potential future MLA in her 20s. Tessica, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Andrew. Yeah. So let's start off with the election. John Horgan has called this a snap election, very short timeline to from the date of the call of the election to the actual date of voting. Uh, many voters have already mailed in their ballots. The NDP currently have nearly a uh, anywhere from a 48 to 50 percent lead in the polls and are obviously looking for a four year mandate with a majority government. So my first question to you is what is at stake? And it's a very open ended question. What's at mm -hmm. stake? In this election? That's a great question and I appreciate it because I think for me, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm running and, and I'm in my 20s, right? And uh, I realized I can't wait 10 or 20 or 30 years to run. You know, the climate crisis can't wait. You know, the housing affordability crisis has already driven so many people I know out of the city or forced people into very difficult, precarious living situations. Um, and of course, with the COVID pandemic, it's already taken so many lives. Um, but I think I'm really grateful to be living here in BC where we've had one of you know the best um, plans and, and we've been able to flatten the curve largely due to Dr. Bon Bonnie Henry, um, but also the Minister of Health, Adrian Dix, um, and the BC NDP government. So I think those that those confluence of, the, of those multitude, multitude of crises really speaks to me to the type of world I want to see. Um, the type of world that I've already been working to create outside of politics and within, you know, the nonprofit, within the community. Um, but I'm realizing that there are limits to what you can do outside of government. And that's why I'm running to be the MLA in Vancouver Langara. Okay, great. And uh, how did you become the candidate for Vancouver Langara? Did you get called up by somebody? Did you submit your uh, application? How did, how did that process work? Yeah, it's it was actually um, quite a long term conversation because I know for a while I've been interested in running and I think okay. the decision was um, at what le which level. Right. And so part of that, I'd done a lot of work at the municipal level, uh, working with the mayor's engaged city task force. I advised uh, Minister Heyman as part of the Climate Solutions and Clean Growth Advisory Council. And through City High, we've done a lot of work also provincially, municipally, but also federally. And most recently, I worked in, in Ottawa with a also an environmental nonprofit uh, called Green Pack that really pushes to advance environmental issues, but through the political channels. Um, and so I think at a certain point, I realized all the issues that I really care about, whether that's, you know, public education, whether that's the environment, whether that's healthcare, even cities, right? They're, they're provincially, they're within the pr provincial jurisdiction. They're creatures of the province, right? Yeah. And so I realized I decided that's that's really the jurisdiction, the area, the level that I think I could have such a big influence on all the issues that I really care about. Um, so it was actually a conversation that began at the being, beginning of this year yeah. um, where I started talking to people that, you know, have done this in the past, um, any advice, um, any words of warning, caution, like what, and I think I was really sitting on whether to run or not. Um, and it wasn't until actually this summer where I made a decision where I was like, I'm going to do this. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm going to do this. And it was watching um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, uh, who, you know, I think many, many of us who follow politics AOC? know her yeah. AOC. Exactly. Yeah. And so you were inspired by her. I was really inspired by her and and um, the documentary on Netflix, Knock Down the House, where she and a whole bunch of other young progressives ran all together. Um, and somewhere in the, in the documentary, she says, hundreds of us need to run for one or two of us to get in, right? And all of a sudden it gave me this fearlessness that it wasn't really about me, you know? Of course it's my name that's on the ballot, mm -hmm. but it's really about us as a movement. And um, part of what really excites me about this campaign is I really hope to inspire other folks who, you know, have never seen themselves represented in politics. Um, if I win, I would be the first MLA of Vietnamese descent elected yeah. to the legislature in BC. Is that right? right. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's never been any, anybody in 
in BC politics of Vietnamese descent that's been in a, represented as an no, MLA. Not to the my Vietnamese knowledge. Vietnamese community is pretty big in BC. It is. It is. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's not just like for myself, but I think for sure. so many folks who are in a similar position who've never seen them, their background, their, you know, folks are aged right. from their, you know, gender orientation, their, their sexual orientation or gender expression. Um, yeah. I And I think it's so critically important because... We need that, whether it's intergenerational leadership, whether that diversity of perspectives, right, yeah. to really uh, to make sure that the policy decisions that we're making are not unintended, uh, don't have those unintended consequences um, from having missed lived experiences. So, if you don't win, mm-hmm. what would you, what would be, uh, what, how, what would make you feel like you've been successful, mm. even if you don't win? Yeah. Well, I was actually talking to Jasmine earlier about yeah. this and um, it's been such an incredible campaign in, in many ways I feel like it's already been worth it like I think because as I made this decision I know that the outcome of the election is you know in many ways beyond my control we can run the best campaign locally um, but you know it's really up to what people are feeling in the day and, and how the central party like how the BCNDP are doing how John Horgan is doing um, but I think what has made it worth it for me is is just working with such an incredible team. And I know within my team, there are at least half a dozen folks who want to run, right? And so by being able to work on my campaign, they can you know really see behind the scenes for themselves what it takes, like what I'm doing, um, and they're contributing towards. So it's it's really our campaign, right? Wow. And so if you know in the next, whether it's municipal or federal or provincial elections, I see them running that would have been the win that I'm looking for as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump into some of the topics that we want to discuss during this um, this podcast. Those topics include uh, youth engagement, mm-hmm. uh, the climate, uh, climate crisis, and, and we're going to finish off by going back to Vancouver, Langara, which is your riding. Yes. So let's start off with youth engagement. Um, now, it's well known and well documented that generally speaking, young people don't vote. Um, the baby boomers, in my view, and I'm not a baby boomer, by the way, mm-hmm. I'm in that middle camp between baby boomers and millennials called the bust generation. We're very bust. small. Oh, yeah, I haven't baby, heard this. The baby bust generation. Baby We're very bust. small. <laughs> or I think the other, uh, I think it's more like generation X. I don't know. Maybe you can look it up, Jeff. Do you know Jeff. why it's called the baby bust generation? Well, because we were like the, the. I think it was because we were like the small group after the oh, boomers. Okay. Like there's the boom right. and then the bust. Like right. there's, okay. you had a big boom that and makes then sense. it's just like yeah. a little the bit cycles of, of asphalt afterwards. And that's me and my no. cohort. <laughs> um, so I'm not a boomer, uh, but uh, my parent, my parents are. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to vote. I'm going to mm-hmm. vote. People in my age category in their 40s and 46 are going to vote. Mm-hmm. You're in the, you're in your 20s. Yeah, most 20 year olds don't vote. I got um, uh, Sean ac- across the room. We're making a lot of fun of our Sean on these podcasts because he doesn't follow politics at all, and he's the kind of person that should vote. Mm-hmm. So, why is it important for young people to get involved? Mm-hmm. I- I'd like to challenge that question because I think that young people have been involved, right? Okay. And, and I agree with you. Maybe not as much within politics, right? Um, but if you look at and the Samara uh, Institute, they've done really good research on this, where they actually look at the level of volunteer hours, like um, social enterprises or nonprofits that have been started by by young people. Um, and I think it's like we have this innate desire to give back, but it's just that politics hasn't spoken to us, that there haven't been people there that look like us, that represent us, that understand the issues, um, that that really grind our gears and are, and are making life difficult for us right now. And that's part of why I want to run is to okay. so that people that are our age can see themselves, you know, in elected positions, that there there is truly intergenerational leadership, right? Because if we look at how quickly the world is changing, not just because of COVID, but before that, because of the, fu- the, the future of work, you know, more and more so, I think, um, you know, going to university and finding a good job and, and working that job for 25, 30 years, that's no longer the reality. Not just for young people, but folks under 50 in general. Like um, the, the, sp- the amount of time that you spend in a workplace and also the job security, you know, there's more and more folks that are working contract um, and there's also less protections that are associated with that because for a long time, you know, it's been the workplace that, that has given you those benefits, uh, whether that's healthcare or sure. dental or all those, yeah. those pieces. Um, and so it's like, I think so many folks in my generation, like we're hustling because like I have so many friends, family members who are age who are working two or three jobs because they can't secure like uh, maybe can't. And also I think there there's two. I think part of it's by challenge and part of it's by choice as well. Right. Okay. So I think there's the, this increased desire for flexibility and and um, agency within our work. But I think there's also um, the other piece where 
well, more and more workplaces are also realizing that if they have contract workers, they don't have to pay additional benefits. They don't, they're not responsible in the long term. And, and also if you have a contract that ends in a year, um, that's something you can also unfortunately hold over your your employees' heads sometimes. Uh, I don't want to make a blanket statement yeah. about that, but but I, I think you know I have seen um, the darker side of that as well. Um, but I think back to your question because I, I might have gone a bit yeah. on a, on a yeah, tangent. Yeah, why, why, why is it important for young people to get involved? Yeah. In, well, in this election. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's our future. And it's also not just our future, it's our present, right? If you think about summer after summer here in BC, we've had the forest fires, whether it's here locally within our borders or, you know, this this summer as well, domestic over in the States, but the wildfires coming up and, and the smoke really blotting out our skies, but also impacting air quality and, and health because of that. You know, we don't have time to wait and to, to sit back and, and to really, um, you know, wait to be in our 40s or 50s to run and to get involved. I think we we have, you know, not just an obligation, but also um, the agency to do so as well. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's just often about um, having an invitation to join. And that's really why, you know, four years ago, I co-founded City Hive to really help craft that, to build bridges between cities and civic institutions that are facing these complex challenges, whether it's homelessness, affordable affordability, um, whether in terms of childcare, housing, um, but also I think really the environmental crisis, the climate crisis at hand and building bridges with young people who have often are highly educated, highly qualified, um, really interested, have the time, have the energy, but are missing the invitation, missing the connections um, to get involved and, and don't know where to put that energy, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think I think also there's, there's, I think this might be a generational thing as well where um, there's a bit of more distrust um, in the political system, right? In, in particularly in partisan politics and right. myself included, right? I think if you look at the headlines, unfortunately, it's mostly, you know, this party has done that, this party, you know, it's and usually it's of, of a negative rhetoric. Mm. Um, and so it's hard. If it helps you feel any better. It's always been like that, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my view. <laughs> right, right. I'm just an outside guy observing. You've given a good explanation as to why they should be involved. So the next question is, how do you get them involved? Like what what have, what are you doing or what has the NDP done mm -hmm. to, to get more young people involved and get them out to vote? Because ultimately, to me, that's the that's the litmus test, right? Mm -hmm. Is, you know, people, people like the, talk, the old saying, talk is cheap. I mean, yeah. how do you get, how are you getting young people to either mail in their ballots yeah. or go to a polling station on October 20, is it 24th or 23rd? 24th. 20, 20, 24th. Yes, exactly. Don't show up on the 23rd. They're not ready for it yet. <laughs> uh, so October 24th exactly. to vote. How are you yeah. going to do that? The, the silver lining of, of um, having a, a, an election during a time where you have to be socially distant is that we have to innovate on how we're reaching out to people. And I think people are already in different places as well. Like door knocking, it certainly is it's the old, age old way of reaching out to people. But if you're in a condo or if you're in a the high rise, like that's also uh, not necessarily possible because of the security measures in the building, right? Um, so uh, yeah, our team, and like this is what really excites me about our team is that we're mostly young. Like there there are definitely, um, there's there are definitely folks who have a lot of experience in campaigns that are part of our team. Um, but most there there's a large group of us that are very young that are very digital like social media savvy that have grown up as digital natives um and that are we're having a lot of fun doing you know this type of digital door knocking through instagram through facebook through twitter to through whatever uh, method and looking at reddit looking at you know other apps and other websites where people are flocking to anyways and going mm -hmm. to meet people there right because i think that's an age-old um uh, idiom or, or, or best practice around engagement is like, don't ask people to come to you, go to where they are already. Right. Sure. And so we're having those conversations all over and it's been, it's been lovely. Cause I, I think, um, it's an allowing people to connect and to be empowered to be part of politics, but through channels where they already exist. Right. So they can, they can actually reach out to their networks, um, while being on social media, while being on their phones, while, yeah. while doing something that they would be doing anyways. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think before that, even with City Hive, uh, what what was really powerful, I think, about what we did was that we found young people that were interested in, let's say, affordable housing or or environment, and we brought them together, like 30 folks from completely different backgrounds. We had folks who were horticulturalists, musicians, like videographers, and we asked them, mm. you know, how how was the um, affordable housing crisis, for example, impacting them already? How were they innovating if they were 
staying in the city, they've found some sort of creative way to make it work. Um, and then we connected them with whether it was housing BC, or BC Housing, whether it was the city of Vancouver, um, Van City, Landlord BC, Real Estate Foundation of BC, like all these unlikely potential allies to talk about what work had already been done to try to address the housing affordability crisis and what more was needed. Where were there still gaps? Where were there opportunities for young people to really innovate and to actually potentially be social entrepreneurs and start a business around this or, or to push for advocacy change um, with a voice that I think only uh, that only we could bring in a perspective that only we could bring, right? And and the result of that was that, you know, there were there were creative solutions that I think you know we've seen in other parts of the world as well. But one of them that I really enjoy talking about is um, it was a project that came out of it called Empty Nesters, where it was about connecting you know folks who want to age in place, their kids have grown up, um, and they might be struggling, needing you know care, uh, struggling with social isolation, uh, and connecting that with younger people who need an affordable place to live, first of all, um, but also could support with elder care or seniors care, whether that's going to pick up groceries twice a mm. week or, it's creative. you know, right? And so yeah. it's it's looking at two needs of different communities, right? And that was something that we came up often against um, when I was at City Hive was that we're not just working for young people. We are centering young people to find solutions that work for us. Yeah. But really what we're trying to build is our intergenerational relationships and partnerships and solutions that can work. Yeah. Well, that's really creative. I yeah. like that idea. Yeah. You know, my world has been largely spent around, in, especially in sports and hockey. And you know, mm. a lot of a lot of young fellows that um, succeed in hockey go off to become junior hockey players, and they're 15, 16, 17, and they don't they they move away from home, and they get what's called billeted, billeted. Oh. So they actually will live with another family, another community. So you're you're maybe a stud hockey player in Vancouver, but you get picked up for a team in Saskatoon, and so a family in Saskatoon will take care of you and you know you also help around the house and that type of thing yeah. and i could see what you're saying like you take the like you're you're riding there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of empty nesters there's also probably a lot of university students absolutely and so they could kind of coexist absolutely and they can maybe whether they need the rent or not probably don't even need the rent but they could have a university student there to help them like mow the lawn or pick up yeah. groceries and then equally that young person would have maybe a cheaper place to live absolutely save for the future it's creative. Yeah. I like that. Neat. Yeah. The other piece of it that I want to add is that yeah. um, it's really stitching back relationships across generations because mm -hmm. so often in our society, we're segregated by age. And in spaces where there are, you know, um, folks that are older and younger, there's often a power dynamic, right? So the older person is the coach or the teacher or the boss or yeah. whatever, you name it, right? The parent. Yeah. Um, and so I think often it doesn't allow for those honest conversations across generations because of those power dynamics, right? right. And and I would hope, you know, living together or um, having conversations and, and some of the work that we were trying to do with City Hive too was putting people at the same level to say, let's just talk as humans about our lived experience. Because I, um, I, there was an article I, I um, or I, I recently spoke with someone from uh, the Taiyi about, like, I think the rhetoric that young people are not I read the article, enough. by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. They're not saving enough, right? If they just yeah. cut back on coffees and avocado toast, yeah. we can, yeah, the they, th they toast. also yeah. will be able to, <laughs> you know, save up for a home, right? And when you look at the data, that's just simply not true. Right. Uh -huh. um, Generation Squeeze did, um, and Paul Kershaw, who's a, um, a professor at UBC, did, did a lot of work on this researching. And, you know, back in 1976, it took five years, based on the average income of, of the region, um, to save up for a uh, 20% down payment on a mortgage, right, on a home. Yeah. Uh, and now, <laughs> 25, it, it actually takes, in Metro Vancouver, it takes 24 years to do that. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think there's some folks on Twitter that, that, um, did the math on, you know, let's say an av an average avocado toast costs this much. <laughs> How many years of life would you like eating avocado toast every single day? <laughs> would you need to just to just save up on um uh uh, to, how, many to years to pay, how, to, how many years? How many years was it? It was something ridiculous. Like Two hundred like, years. Yeah, something ridiculous. Where it's like your yeah. whole lifetime, and then right. you'll just get the twenty percent down, so you yeah. can start. You know, once you're once yeah. I'm in my eighties. But maybe eating avocado toast for two hundred years keeps gives you a longer lifespan. No, I don't know. Do you know more about the health I impacts? I don't, I don't eat avocado toast. Uh, <laughs> that's why you have yeah. a home, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Um, okay, well, that's that's really good. Um, let me let me ask you this before we jump on to the climate issue. Um, Andrew will uh, sorry, Andrew Wilkinson, no, Andrew Weaver, Andrew Weaver, former former leader of the BC Green Party, 
had been advocating for years to lower the voting age to 16. I've seen some crazy references to people suggesting we lower the voting age to age eight, which is my daughter, my oldest daughter's age eight. Do you think she's ready? I don't think she has a clue. <laughs> okay. yeah, we're, we're educa I'm educating her. We're educating right. her. I'm sure she's um, listening to the yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah. So my question to you is, Do you are you in favor of lowering a voting age? From, what is it today? I guess it's, it depends on the province or the, if it's federal or provincial. So mm -hmm. in BC, it's 19, mm -hmm. but yeah. federally it's 18, I think. Um, so are you in favor of lowering the voting age and what level would you lower it to? Hmm. Well, I think my answer would be a shocker to you. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I was actually chatting with uh, Mira, who's she was 14 when she started this campaign okay. uh, to lower the voting age. She is now 16. Unfortunately, yeah. we're not there yet, um, but she's done incredible advocacy work um, and uh, it was actually passed at the BC NDP convention unanimously to lo to lower the voting age. So it's um, it's unfortunate it's not not on the platform this time. So but on. I think there's so the BC NDP. So if if I was wanting to elect uh, the next leader of the BC NDP and I was like 14 years old, I could vote. If... <laughs> no, so sorry, sorry, I should clarify. Yeah. Um, so there was a motion that was passed unanimously to lower the voting age to 16. So that's okay. that's that was a motion provincially. Ended. Provincially. Um, Has the NDP, CNDP lowered the voting age to elect who's the party leader? That's a good question. I'm actually not I would, sure. I would think I that, wish, that would be a good precedent, yeah, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you know, kind of like uh, um, you got to kind of drink your own Kool-Aid totally, first. Totally, right? yeah. So, um, good, let me let me actually bring so that here, back. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna leave this because you're you're obviously yeah. you're passionate about this. Um, I think that the uh, the reason that a lot of um, left leaning socialist progressive um, leaders want to see the voting age lower is because um, people tend to be a lot more um, altruistic about their views of the world, and they don't they haven't they haven't gone through a lot of negative experiences. They haven't paid taxes. They haven't had to deal with the difficulties of life when they're young. Mm. And so, and I, you know, so people tend to be more liberal leaning when they're older, and be become more conservative leaning when they're when uh, sorry when they're younger, mm. and conservative leaning when they're older. It's just mm -hmm. a general trend. Yeah. Um, so here's my proposed solution. Okay. Because I think it's going to be a tough. It's going to be very very difficult to convince enough people to uh, a voting age, because it's the voters who are around now that have mm -hmm. to agree to let younger people vote. Mm -hmm. I think what we need, and this goes back to your comment earlier about engagement through social media, Instagram, Reddit. I mean, most boomers probably don't even know what Reddit is. Jasmine's getting a tutorial on Reddit soon. Um, is is being able to vote through an app. Mm -hmm. Because I think that if if, if we could see our our voting system progress from this archaic mail in your vo voting ballot or go to a polling station mm -hmm. to i mean if i can do like so complicated financial transactions that require a great deal of security through the app on my phone surely i should be able to vote from my phone and i think if you can get if you can convince the government to switch and convince enough people to just be able to allow online voting app based voting that's a big step forward in getting younger people to engage. Because imagine how many, I mean, I don't, do you know what the statistic is on how many people under the age of, say, 25 actually voted a public election? No, but I do know that, that in the last federal election and in 2015 as well, it increased significantly. And it contributed, they, they were able to attribute um, the change in government at the federal yeah. level to the part the increase in participation of young people so okay, interesting. um there's still got to be a very low number i imagine i think it is lower than certainly other generations yeah um but, so I, that, anyways that's yeah. something to take away is i think that instead of the, the the big battle in my view would be trying to get the low voting age lowered that's a really mm -hmm. that's a huge mountain to climb mm -hmm. versus just getting us switched over to a app-based voting system mm -hmm. i think if we could get there yeah. You'll find people like Sean mm -hmm. who aren't voting today. Let's if he can do it from the comfort of his own home while he's watching a football game, maybe he doesn't vote for the right person because he's not paying attention, but at least he's voting. Mm -hmm. Right, That's the first step. Yeah. Anyways, that's that's my No, I, I, I really like that idea. And I would say that because of COVID now, you know, um, the, the legislature is voting virtually, right? Like yeah. there, and also um, Parliament is is starting to figure out how to do that as well, right? So I think it, it is pushing um, for that. And I think you're absolutely right. If we can... If we are doing complex financial transactions yeah. online, we have systems, we have the technology. We can do place. it. We can do it. Absolutely. It's, it's just the technology is there. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think I just wanted to add a piece, though, about 
lowering the voting age because I think um, certainly that's one argument like you know that that younger people are more generally progressive or liberal in their values but I think the part of it that's really important to me um, is that that we are starting to build those habits at a young age to participate, to engage in our democracy. Right. And so if young people are starting to vote when they're 16, when you're able to drive, you know, when you're able to like, I think I, I think if you're responsible enough to drive, you should be responsible enough to figure out your, your opinions on an issue. Um, but there could also be the potential for better education, better curriculum um, in, in um, BC schools to actually talk more. Because I, I think I still remember being in, in high school, it wasn't too long ago. Um, and the way that we were taught about our political systems was so boring, was so, so boring. dry. Yeah. And I'm a so politico. Like, I, right. I follow this Yeah, stuff and you were and interested in I it. I was interested yeah. or tried to be interested yeah. in it. And I think I got way more engaged after high school, not through the curriculum, right? Right. And so I was like, if, if you know, when you're still in high school, everybody's doing it. And that's like, that's your first interaction, your first engagement with it. It's just the norm. It's just what you do. You don't think about it. Um, then I think that 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 would increase civic engagement. That would yeah. increase democratic participation in so many ways yeah. um, that I think a lot of us can't even imagine. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it needs to be a real revamp of our education system for educating kids on importance of voting, being being involved yeah. in um, politics, whether you're actually taking a real frontline approach like you are, or even just be participating in that vote. Yeah. As well, as much as is also important to educate kids, uh, young people on finances. Yeah. And like how to manage their money, Absolutely. which is my world. Absolutely. It's a, it, yeah. So uh, I want to talk about climate crisis. But Absolutely. before we do that, because you brought up a really interesting point, you mentioned COVID and we've talked about that a couple of times. Mm-hmm. John Horgan announced uh, this election just a few weeks ago, and he mm-hmm. stated his reasoning for it was twofold. One is we need a stable government mm-hmm. uh, in Victoria. And the Friday just before he announced, he announced this on a Monday, and the Friday just before that, Sonia Firstenau, who we had here as a guest, went and met with John in person and said, you have a stable government and you've had a stable government for three and a half years. We've supported them through the CASA, the yeah, confidence, confidence and supply agreement. Confidence, confidence and, love supply, the acronyms. and supply agreement. Um, he also <laughs> stated that there's never a bad time to ask people to decide who should be running their province. Mm-hmm. Um, the BC liberals and the, Greens have come out and said, well, there actually is a bad time. And it's probably like right now when we're in the middle of a major pandemic. Um, you've mm-hmm. talked about the um, the fact that it's it's there's a lot of health risks for people mm-hmm. being out and engaged in social environments. They've had to change their habits. Yet uh, we've he's called an election. So how do you respond to the fact that John Horgan has called a snap election? And he's never said it's because he wants to have a majority government and that he wants to have more power in Victoria. Mm. But, you know, the cynical people out there like myself have got to say, well, of course it is. Mm-hmm. How do you respond? Yeah, I think I think it's a really valid question to ask, right? Um, and I think, you know, certainly um, Sonia Firstino and, and like the Greens have supported and worked quite collaboratively with the BCNDP. So I have, you know, very little bad things to say about that. Um, but I think it would be a stable government for one more year. Right. And I think what we're trying to talk about is a long term mandate for four years to be able to because some of the work, if we make commitments and we want to say we want to fund a 10 year cancer plan, like we don't have credibility to do that if we have a year left. Right. And I think that the mandate in the platform that we had before COVID changes everything. It really does. Um, and I would say to the the part around like the fears of it not being safe, um, it was our health officials, right? Dr. Bonnie Henry, who told us, you know, regardless of whether it's this fall or in the spring or, you know, next fall, COVID will be with us. Um, and so we need to figure out not how to delay and to stop, you know, what what happens in our daily life, but try to, to figure out how we live with it, right? And Elections BC, I think, has come up and done a lot of good um, and hard work to make sure that it's completely safe. Like over 500,000 people have already requested a mail-in ballot. And I think that's an innovation that wasn't there before because of COVID. And I certainly hope it continues to become an option even after um, COVID, right? Because I think it's making it way more accessible for folks who might have, whether it's transportation um, uh, barriers, um, and like a, whole, a variety of accessibility issues, right? 
Um, in my riding in Vancouver Langara specifically, there are 10 um, like seniors care facilities, whether they're long-term care, assisted living, um, and pretty much Elections BC has made a plan for every single one. Five of them have gone through and they're requesting mail-in ballots for all of their residents. And the other five, um, there'll actually be two election officials that are sent to each of those um, facilities uh, to help administer this, right? And so it was up to those facilities to decide how they wanted um, to support their residents to engage in, in democratic um, participation. And I think it's so important too. Um, and I think if anything, it's it's really um, asking the question at the right time. Like it, we didn't, obviously, you know, during the first six months of this pandemic, we were focused, we were working together. And I think I would like to think a very cross-partisan way to make sure that we're prioritizing British Columbians and we're not um, bickering about the politics, right? Uh, but I think at this moment, at this time, we do need a long-term mandate in order to really achieve the level of ambition that we want, whether it be healthcare, whether it be the environment, whether it be supporting seniors and supporting all of us during the COVID pandemic and, and figuring out how to support business as well. Um, I've been speaking to a lot of local businesses. We actually have a, a roundtable later today um, with local business leaders because I, I know that so many, so many of them have been really hard hit. Right. And as someone who started a nonprofit organization, but was it was a social enterprise as well. I understand how hard it is, you know, the the complexities of having to figure out staffing age like and, and the uncertainty of, of income. And um, and yeah, just it's just been such a new and different environment. And I, I know that um, the federal and the provincial, all levels of government have a role to play to support all of us to make sure that um, we're not just weathering this pandemic, but we're emerging from it stronger and more resilient. Let's jump on to um, the climate crisis um, or climate change, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. I'm sure you would like to call it a climate crisis. Yeah. Um, the climate emergency. High emergency. <laughs> We're going to talk about the weather, the climate, <laughs> uh, not more, more than the weather. So yeah. this is obviously one of the big, one of the two big topics that you seem to like to want to talk about. It's very important to you. Absolutely. So I'm going to start off by simply asking with COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, climate issues, which is arguably your, your signature issue, has lost its spotlight. I mean, if we go back to this time last year, Greta Thun Thunberg, Thunberg yeah. was like this messiah on our planet that uh, <laughs> I think she even got um, named the time person of the year. Yeah. Um, basically, she, her voice is non-existent these days. No one's really seeming to pay attention, being paying attention to climate issue. So how do you address that in this campaign? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, I think the climate crisis, or as some of some folks are calling it now, the climate emergency, um, has been a climate has been a pandemic um, for us long before COVID, and will be long after COVID. So I think regardless of whether the media, or regardless of whether I think folks are talking about it, um, it intersects, right? It, it intersects with what's happening now, and and I think it has to be a continued priority, and that's part of why I want to run. Because I know that I don't have generations, decades to wait to, to really push for bold climate action, right? And I've been doing that since my high school days, um, you know, with the um, with a lot of advocacy and, and uh, grassroots organizing. But as I mentioned earlier, there's limits to what we can do outside of government, right? This is this is truly an area where political will and political leadership is needed. Um, and so. Yeah, I've been really like for the past two years, I've been um, advising Minister Heyman, who uh, as part of the Climate Solutions and Clean Growth Advisory Council, lovely acronym, six, six letters <laughs> of BC, so eight. <laughs> um, but I know that if you look across the country, if you look around the world, I think there are very few governments that actually have climate plans that match the level of urgency that we need to be acting on. Um, and it's been really inspiring for me to see how seriously this government has been taking it. I think it actually dispelled a lot of the distrusts that I had, um, especially George being someone who came from the nonprofit environmental world, who came from Sierra Club of BC, you know, and who understands the issue. Um, and for myself, as I studied environmental science, right, I, I that that is my academic background, and it's also been the work that I've been doing in the community for over a nearly a decade now, let's say a decade. So what has the BC NDP done to address uh, the climate issue? Mm -hmm. Well, what I've really appreciated about their approach is that, you know, even in the name, it wasn't just looking at climate separate from the economy. It was looking at how can we see and, and make sure that as we're transitioning to a low carbon economy, um, that we're really prioritizing clean jobs. Like we know that people 
like we need to support people's livelihoods. And I think there's often this argument, and in many ways, sometimes it is true, right? That the good thing to do, the right thing to do costs more, right? But I think there are also situations, there are also solutions like the empty nesters solutions, I say, that are win-win-win solutions, right? That can be the best thing for the environment, that can make life more affordable and can also support jobs, right? And we need to obviously look at supporting those first, right? So whether it's looking at, um, rebates for folks so that they can improve the energy and efficiency in their homes, right? Like hot water boilers, not a sexy topic, not a <laughs> in miles, but it's, it, those are it, retro, retrofitting, like building step codes, like uh, looking at creating a mandate to support uh, zero emissions vehicles, it's fuel switching so that um, the, the fuel that, you know, for, will still have, um, un unfortunately, internal combustion engines for quite a while, that that's kind of the system and that's kind of the technology that we have and it'll take some time to transition. So in that transition, how do we ensure that the fuels that we're using are lower, lower, lower carbon, lower emission, more efficient as well, right? So like whether you look at, whether it's active transportation, right? Like that's also an area where there are co-benefits cool around the health impacts of you know moving biking even public transit you have to walk there you know you and there's there's health benefits of that right and we know that those solutions right now are not accessible to all people and that's that's been really an issue um, with the environmental movement for a long time around um, some solutions for the environment being only accessible to certain class right like I can't buy a Tesla. I would love to have a, you know, a great car, but that's not within my price range, right? And so what are the solutions that are available and accessible to a broad range of folks across, you know, the economic spectrum um, to be able to participate and to be able to move towards a low carbon economy but without penalizing people unfairly because they're poor, mm -hmm. like, or that we're poor, you know? Right. right? Um, and and so I think it's this, the, the Clean BC plan, um, not only does it look at bold climate solutions, but it also looks at affordability and it also looks about jo at jobs. And those are the types of solutions that I know that we have to fight for. They're not going to be all the time the sexiest ones, um, but actually we need to look at the data to see where the most emission reductions um, are possible. But it also looks at the adaptation side. Like I can nerd about this for a long time, but it's looking at what parts of BC are actually most vulnerable to climate risks and what are the likely climate risks that are coming up. Because mm -hmm. it's we know mitigation is certainly one side of it, but there's also the whole adaptation element of it. Climate change is already happening. The impacts are already here. I think we've all seen it during the summer most visibly, um, but also the pine beetle, you know, um, uh, that impacted uh, the forestry industry in such a deep way yeah. is also linked to to shorter winters as well, right? So, um, shorter, warmer win winters, yeah, exactly, right. So, Tessica, yeah. let's say you get elected, yeah, you you, un you unseed Michael Lee, you're now the MLA for Vancouver Langara, mm -hmm. and let's say amazingly George Heyman doesn't get elected, no, and, and, and John Horgan <laughs> goes, well, think. who's going to be the new minister in charge of uh, the environment and climate action? And everybody points at Tessica and says, you're in charge now. What are like two or three specific policies or initiatives that you would bring to the table immediately? And I want you to get specific here, like, like granular ideas that yeah. people can kind of like wrap their head around. Yeah. As opposed um, to just saying like clean jobs. Totally. That's a thank you for the question. Um, my number one priority would be to support First Nations okay. on reserves who are unfortunately, many of them are not connected to the grid. And so they're stuck using diesel, really high carbon, you know, um, energy sources. Um, and it's an equity issue as well. It's a reconciliation issue, right? When we look at the disproportionate access to opportunities that comes with, you know, connectivity in terms of the internet. And and I think the pandemic has really shown us that some of us, we can we can easily work from home and it's all good. Um, but for some of us, um, that's not a solution that works for all of us, right? Um, and so it's looking, I think- Interesting. So there's a number of First Nations communities across BC. I'm assuming they've got to be more, more ro 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 remote locations. Yes, yeah. That um, the only access they have to uh, electricity is by way of diesel. D d diesel generators. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I actually, um, I lived up in Haida Gwaii. Okay. And the reason why I went there was because I wanted to learn about co-governance between the Council of Haida Nation um, and the federal government, the provincial government, and how they had been starting to co-manage, uh, you know, parks and natural resources, whether it's fisheries, forests, all that. Um, but what I, one of the things that I learned from my time there was also how, you know, despite 
how bold they wanted to be in terms of, you know, their sustainability, their climate. They were, you know, one of those communities that um, unfortunately are reliant on a lot of... On diesel being shipped in exactly. by barge or whatever. Exactly. Wow. Especially being an archipelago, right? Right. And so they had built some of their own amazing solar projects. Like they, they've done a lot of this work since I've been there. I was there in, I think, 2016, 2015, something okay. like that. So that was five years ago. And, and their own communities have done a lot of leadership. But um, we need to be funding this, right? Because it also creates local long-term jobs in the community that can't be exported, right? It also is a reconciliation issue so that we can be supporting Indigenous communities in BC who ha for a long time have not had the funding that they needed to be able to access the same standard of life that you right. and I have as British Columbians in Metro Vancouver. Right. right? Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's a good one. So what else do you have? I like that. That's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's an original idea. Like it yeah. was actually, you know, the folks up there who who taught me this and who shared that. And, and um, yeah, I have a lot of uh, gratitude for uh, um, from the learnings that that I learned during my time up in Haida Gwaii. Um, I think a huge, a huge focus um, would be really figuring out how we can support of course, enhancing active transportation and public transportation, better funding that. And I think part of that has already and been... What is active transportation? Yes. Like basically okay. riding a bike? It's pretty much any form of transportation that's not cars, where you're sedentary, where you're sitting so much, right? And so it can be riding a bike, it can walking. be walking, it can be public transit, um, it can be, you know, longboarding, skateboarding. I'm I'm actually a longboarder, right? Are you really? Yeah, I am. That's and super cool. part of why I longboard so much is because I live not, like, not close enough to a, a train station and so yeah. it takes like something that would be a 15 minute walk would be a quick like yeah you know three minute longboard ride um, did you see jagmeet singh's longboard tiktok video i, I don't know if he was on a longboard or not <laughs> it, i can tell it could be a skateboard it could be a longboard it was out he's of the kind shot. of into his fold-up yeah. bike so yeah i was yeah. also wondering i was like it could also be like um what are those you know those single wheeled things i've been oh yes about. i don't yeah. even know what they're called yeah. like yeah. hoverboards like yeah. i think <laughs> depends on what company you're picking but um okay yeah. so you're a longboarder yeah and that would be yeah. part of active active so how, how how would you what would you implement as far as like new policies or initiatives to support more active transportation like what are some specific yeah. granular things that you would like to see happen absolutely well i love to bike and i've biked i've been a cyclist pretty much my whole life and i've been in three accidents right in my life that okay. where i some one of them i ended up in the hospital my dad was behind me he saw it happen you know and he didn't cause the accident no 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 no, <laughs> okay, no, no he, but he, he watched it happen you can just imagine one of the reasons why people don't cycle is it's not safe you're right. Great. Like it's still. I, and as a cyclist, I would love to say that it is. And I would love to encourage more people to do that. So what needs to be done? We need better cycling infrastructure. Right. And what does that look like? Um, separated bike lanes. Um, I think dedicated lanes for it. Um, and if you there's examples around the world, like I think Copenhagen is also often pointed to. But um, I think you can look all over the world for um, places where cycling infrastructure is much more. Um, well supported, well funded, um, and it would encourage children. It would encourage families to to cycle and to you know maybe even to have um, to to cycle pool to to the schools together, right? Yeah. And it it's it seems like it's a small thing, but it actually isn't because I think it's it's much more about the values that we're teaching, the values that we're instilling um, in our community and in, in future generations as well, right? It's not just good for the environment; it also can foster community. You're moving at a slower rate through your communities, and so it's been proven. If there's more pedestrian and cycling traffic, it actually supports businesses, right? right. Because if you're in a car, you need to find parking. Like you're not going to stop at three different shops along this main street, right? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the health benefits of active transportation, right? Yeah. But we also know um, that that's not a solution necessarily for all British Columbians, right? We know that outside of of BC, or sorry, outside of Metro Vancouver, um, you know, we need to figure out solutions that actually support folks who are living in rural areas, so that they also have either zero emission vehicles, and that's the cheaper, more affordable, more accessible thing to do. That there's strong connectivity between northern communities, and I know that you know the the loss of the Greyhound had a huge impact on that. But this provincial government stepped up and tried to restore as much of the connectivity between um, communities in the north. And I think we still need more investment in that front, um, and specifically in Vancouver Lanigarra, because that's the riding that I'm running into. Um, I've heard over and over again that. There's great connectivity north-south, 
but there's not great connectivity east-west. And so if you look at um, the transportation system uh, or the public transportation system in, in Vancouver, Langara, there are no buses between 49th all the way down to Marine Drive. Um, and I think for those of you that are not familiar with Metro Vancouver, like that's probably like a hundred. It's a lot of area. It's a lot of area. Like that's over. There's no buses. Blocks. There's no buses that go east west. East west. Right. And so if you live within yeah. that part of the city, I could see that for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. You you are essentially car locked unless you want to walk like twenty blocks to try to get sure. to a bus stop. Right. And that's just not a solution that's going to work mm. for lots of folks. You know. So um, I think. We, we need to look at, I think, um, equity within uh, transportation solutions. Because if I think people in Vancouver often talk about um, the west side of Vancouver versus the east side of Vancouver. And I think yeah. the, the, the difference in, you know, um, income, let's say, right? Um, and But if you look from north and from south Vancouver, I would say that south Vancouver also doesn't get a lot of love, right? It, right. it often doesn't, um, if you looked at where the, the Moby bike stations were first implemented where if you look at where um you know the a lot of the sky train and also rapid bus infrastructure was implemented it it's also more so um on the northern part of vancouver right yeah, and so i can see that yeah i want to be an advocate for the southern part of vancouver because we often get forgotten right um and and there's this vicious cycle where you know if there aren't isn't public transit if it isn't accessible for folks to come to the punjabi market or to come to the jewish community center then people stop coming and then it also has an impact on the, so you know it's self reinforcing in that sure. way right so if we can um really foster public transportation but all forms of active transportation um within that's within Vancouver Langara that would have such a great impact uh for the business community there as well yeah yeah now Tesca let me uh f also ask you though about uh LNG Canada mm -hmm. because here you have um a a government who claims that the environment's very important to them being the BC NDP mm -hmm. it is the same this okay <laughs> And and this is also the same government that was ripping into Christy Clark and the BC Liberals over LNG Canada for many years, saying it was a waste of taxpayers' dollars. We were giving away too many tax incentives for these big multinational corporations to come over here and take our a, a resources offshore to fuel carbon emissions across the planet, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Then the BC NDP come into power, and now suddenly it's green-lighted. Mm -hmm. uh, much against the will of the BC Green Party, it was it was yeah. passed uh, through our legislative assembly because the Liberal Party of BC and the Green and the NDPs. So, sure. how how do you possibly support? Or maybe don't I don't know. But what how do you contrast those two? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both pipelines. They're both you know they're both extracting mm -hmm. resources out of the ground. Arguably, just as environmentally devastating to pull natural gas out through fracking activity uh, as, as it is to, to just pull oil sands and mm -hmm. wash them for oil. Yeah. How do you respond? I really appreciate this question because this is exactly why I'm running, right? I think politics is all about the people that show up, uh -huh. right? And um, I know that in the, the case of LNG, it's it's a very complex issue. And let's get into the weeds because I, I sure. can probably tell I like getting into the weeds about it. Um, so I think especially given my background as an environmentalist, I was very, it was very black and white for me when I was younger. I was like, yes, like, you know, if it's it, if it's infrastructure projects that are um, going to increase our carbon emissions, then like that's not the path we need to go on, right? Um, but I think if we, within the case of LNG, and there are a lot of ifs here for me, right? So um, uh, I guess the first piece I would say is that um, it ha was framed in the past and it continues to be framed as a transition fuel, right? And if it is actually being used to displace coal use in other parts of the world, right? And, and we know like specifically in China, they've been importing a lot of coal from Australia Right. And we know that this LNG is actually the cleanest LNG that we can produce in the world because of the hydropower that we have. Um, then then I think there's credibility to call it a transition fuel. But if there isn't, like if, if, if it's just being sold, if it's just increasing, you know, the, the carbon, because we know like we can only manage what we can with which is within our jurisdiction in bc right and yet the extraction that we have you know that piece of it is going to impact our global emissions right because 
climate change doesn't stop at borders, right? And so I don't think it's a long-term solution. I don't think, right. you know, that 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 that's very clear. That's my position. Um, and I think, you know, if we are to support it, we need to look at the ifs, right? We need to look at the nuances of it, right? I think the other piece too is that um, the BCNDP has made it really clear that the, you know, if LNG projects are to go to ha go ahead, it has to fit within our carbon budget, right? So it has to. And right now in the work that we did with the first, um, with Clean BC, which is the climate plan um, that I advised Minister ha Heyman on for the past two two to three years, um, it it actually, the, the climate plan that was released brings us 75% to our 2030 goals, right? So we still need to, in order to, if we get a mandate to continue to work on this, the next phase of Clean BC is to figure out what that remaining 25% is, right, towards our 2030 goals. But we actually need to continue because that's only our 2030 targets, which is 40% reduction, right? And our provincial government are, and the BCNDP have now committed to net zero carbon, right? And so... I think it's about looking at it holistically, right? Not just with in terms of the context of BC, but also in the context of the world, right? And so I don't, I don't think it's a long-term solution. I think there's a potential for it to be a bridging feel, a transition feel, if it is used in the right way. Um, and the other piece of it, and I think it connects to like the conversation that I was, we were just having about the TMX, is that it's actually a project that has been um, supported by the First Nations Climate Initiatives, which is a consortium of four First Nations um, uh, groups uh, on on the West Coast, where you know where this project is happening, um, and 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 other First Nations groups as well. And so, I, I don't I don't think that I can speak for First Nations. I think there's a diversity of opinions of from First Nations groups and hereditary chiefs, and and also um, uh, band band councils on on the issue. Um, but I think that often we paint um indigenous communities as just being one-sided or for or against uh, just against um these projects um and i think yeah, they're, they're going to be di as diverse as the rest us, of the population as, as diverse as all of british <laughs> just doesn't make right? yeah they're not, and they're not as homogeneous as some people might paint them absolutely as. not and i think that the reason why so many or this is my perception of it so please uh, but my perception is that um we have Ex um, economically excluded First Nations, Indigenous communities in not just in BC, but across Canada for so long. And this is from the, the history of our history of systemic racism, right? From the history of colonization that continues to exist to this day, right? And so, um, you know, when Indigenous communities need economic development opportunities, um, this is one of them. This is not the only, and I think that we should actually be thinking more broadly than LNG projects because I don't think we should be um, asking them to make sacrifices to their environment and their communities and also to our climate collectively as a, as a human and, and as a species on, in, on this planet. Um, but I think we also need to, to, to look at how are we, you know, if we are going to say no to these types of projects, how are we going to support indigenous communities that need this investment, that need community economic development? And I, I believe truly that there are other ways of doing it. So mm -hmm. it's very nuanced. It's a very complex. Which you highlighted earlier. Yes. With the, yes. you know, renewable energy projects in these remote communities. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's there are hundreds of other, like that's just one example of it, right? But I think right. hundreds of other projects and stories and work. Um, and I don't think that we should be... Uh, um, you know, um, reducing the, the 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 number of options. So, I feel like it's not a black or white issue. I've given you a lot of gray, but yeah. I think that's the space that I operate within. Yeah. Right? Is that we need to be having conversations in this gray area so that we can that we're not in our own camps just saying yes or just saying no, but actually talking about what if you know what is possible you know and yeah. um and if it's a transition field at what point do we transition out of it right yeah. <laughs> like i think yeah. there's there's um there's possibility for vision and collaboration and um i think lng has been such a lightning rod right because i think it's symbolic in the way that p pipelines have been symbolic um but we need to look at the big picture of, of of this and figure out what are the solutions that are going to be best for us for as british columbians for the world for indigenous communities um and also for the planet right yeah. for the future of the planet so i i think not that the focus on lng is misplaced i think it's we should be focusing on it and we should be figuring out 
you know, what are the other possibilities that are, um, that should be on the table and that we're not discussing yet. Well said, Tessica. Okay, let's dial all this conversation back as we wrap this up to Vancouver Langara. Michael Lee is your primary competitor in this election and largely represents the type of residents that live in Vancouver Langara. And Michael, if you're listening, I apologize, but you're older, you're married, you have children, living in, living in single family homes with probably carbon emission cars. They're probably not all driving electric cars, professional c- careers and paying high taxes. Mm-hmm. Do you think the issues, this first question for you, do you think the issues we've discussed, such as youth engagement, environment resonate with the voters in your riding? Mm-hmm. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted to run in Vancouver Langara, not just because I have a very strong, like I went to high school there, I went to uh, Mandarin school every Sunday, um, or sorry, every Saturday for nearly a decade. I've, I've seen the neighborhood, I've seen the community change with the introduction of the Canada Line. Like I know the riding so well, like the back of my hand. Um, and it's also the writing where I've grown up in, you know, where I've lived, I've loved, I've laughed, and I've gained so much from it. I really want to give back to this community. And one of the reasons why I chose to run in this writing um, is that this writing, like many other writings, um, even though there was, there are about 60,000 people in this writing in the last census, so there's more now, uh, only about 20,000 vote, right? And so I think we're not speaking to a huge swath of people that are there, you know, whether they're renters, whether they're students, whether they're, you know, seniors whose long-term care and assisted living like have been privatized and there's been cuts to healthcare. Like I think there's so many folks who are either disengaged, disillusioned by politics, have never been engaged, um, or might be new Canadians, might be new citizens, you know, who might be wanting to vote for the first time, but don't have the language access, right? And we're, we, we aren't necessarily reaching out to those communities. And so that was one of my biggest priorities when I ran. Um, if you look at my team, we're so diverse. And that's, I'm so proud of that. It's mostly one of, women of color, folks who are queer, folks who are trans, like folks who have lots of experience, but have not been given the opportunity to actually lead those teams. We talked about, you know, Stephen Kimberly before, right? They're both young, brilliant. They've Work, done work at the federal level uh, campaigning um, and I wanted to empower them to have like a leadership position within my team because th- that's also reflective of who's in Vancouver Langara, right? We, it's such a diverse um, community with so many language groups, right? So many cultural groups. And so the first media interviews and, and work that I did was actually uh, with Connect 91 FM, which is mostly a South Asian radio station or a radio mm-hmm. station. Um, then I did a podcast with the Vietnamese Professionals Association of BC, which was translated English and uh, in back and forth from English and, and Vietnamese so that we could we could reach a whole new population, right? I did an uh, interview uh, with Radio Canada. I speak French fluently. And there's a large French community because that's where l'Alliance Française is based, um, specifically about systemic racism. Um, in, and it actually just got published today. Good for um, you. And and so like and then I could go on and on. Right. Yeah. Like I've been trying to distinctly reach out to communities that are not English speaking because that's a huge part of who's in Vancouver Langara. And of course, I'm doing English media as well. Um, but I think we can set a different bar for how we engage and how we do pol- politics. And we know that not just Vancouver Langara, but B.C. as a whole is way more diverse than it looks like in, in the legislature right now. And right. That's why, you know, that's not the only reason why I'm running, but that's yeah. a big piece of why I'm running um, and and why I think Vancouver Langara, but also Victoria needs my voice there. A last question, which you've already partially answered, is you've got Tessica mm-hmm. Trong versus Michael Lee. What else should voters know about voters in Vancouver Langara as to what's the, the stark difference? Give me one or two examples of the of what you're going to get with Tessica that you're not going to get with Michael. Yeah, well, I've been in in the riding almost every day this this election and I just haven't seen Michael like uh, he's been, you know, the MLA for the past three years. Um, and f- I have so many friends who live in the riding and they're like, yeah, we heard about him maybe like three, four years ago when he was running. But since then, like we haven't heard from him at all. We haven't seen him at our events. We haven't, um, we've never gotten something in the mail from him. You know, we haven't gotten emails. Like we just don't know what he's up to, right? And I'm sure he's busy doing work, but for who, right? And if you look at his donors and then you look at his actions, I think it really speaks to who he advocates for. Um, And I'm someone who's shown up in the community. I started my activism at Churchill Secondary in the riding where I saw that us as students, 
we didn't have access to good tap water, right? <laughs> the water fields, the water fountains didn't work. They were lead in our pipes. You know, of course, it's still under the acceptable level, but is that really the standard <laughs> that we're shooting for for our students, our future good. generations? Yeah. Um, but also from like an environmental perspective, right? Like then you're selling bottled water, then like we go into privatization of water and the social issues that are the social dimension of that, right? And so um, one of the first campaigns that I ran when I was in high school was to try to phase out the sales of bottled water in our school. And we were not only successful in doing that, but we also fundraised and installed four new water refill stations in Churchill. Then I spoke to, to students across the city and they started their own Churchill, or their own Youth for Tap, Bing Youth for Tap, you know, their own clubs. And we realized that we were fighting the same battles at our schools. So we banded together, created a coalition, and we worked with the school district. Um, to install new water refill stations in every single public high school in Vancouver. Wow. That was when I was in high school. So wow. I'm just getting started. Um, <laughs> and it's not like bottled water is the most sexy issue. I'd say it's like yeah. the least <laughs> sexy issue. But it was something, a problem that I saw in my community that other students, other teachers, that other administrators also saw as a problem. But we just needed to organize around it. And that's my commitment is that I'm a fighter. I'm an advocate. I'm someone who cares. I'm someone who listens. I've been appointed as a dialogue associate at SFU, the Center for Dialogue. It's a global center for really, you know, moving away from this divisive, polarizing conversation to really talking about dialogic, collaborative solutions. Um, one of the youngest di dialogue associates. And it's been my work to bring people together from diverse perspectives, diverse communities, to see that we have more in common than what sets us apart. And that's the vision that I have for not just Vancouver Langara. Of course, that's the place that I, I want to be listening and doing most of my work. But I think the work that happens in Vancouver Langara is connected to the entire province. And that is the work that I want to do for BC, wow. for the world. Well said, Tesca. It's inspiring. Um, people want to get involved. They want to get involved, help you out. Yeah. Uh, how do they con connect with you? What can? Wh where can you get it? Wh where could you use some help? Absolutely. Well, um, uh, my website is www. Tessica Trong, and it's a spelling that's a bit different because my mom was quite creative. So I'll spell it out. It's T E S I C C A. T R U O N G uh, dot C A. Um, and they can volunteer there. They can donate. Of course, as you can imagine the folks that are in my community are not the most affluent. So I think that's that we definitely like whether you can donate your time, whether you can donate your energy or your connections, your 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 social networks, amplifying our message, making sure that especially in an election that, as you as you said, is is quite short, um, that people are know that there's an election, that they know who their candidates are, who they know their options and they know that Tessica Trong is going to fight for them. Well, wow. good message. Well, I wish you the best of luck, Tessica. Uh, you are the uh, BC NDP candidate for Vancouver Langara. You're well spoken, very energized, and uh, I'm sure you're going to do quite well if it's not in this election. Some point in your future, uh, in your future elections, because it doesn't. I, I don't think this will be the last time you run for office, whether you win or don't. So, uh, best of luck to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate having you here today. Thank you, Andrew. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I wish we had more time. Yeah, good stuff. Tessica Trong, BC NDP candidate for Vancouver Langara.